I'm Alex Valtrades, and this is the Sunday Book Circle for Growing Things by Paul Tremblay. Growing Things is a collection of horror short stories. This anthology is actually pretty long. There are 19 stories in all. Some of the short stories are about world-changing horror, much in the way of 1950s sci-fi movies, and some of them are more traditional in depicting small bits of focused horror. Some of them are written somewhat strangely, in formats that aren't common or familiar to readers. To be honest, there probably isn't actually a bad short story in Growing Things. There are shiny gems that stand out, but all of them are good. Since there are 19, I couldn't possibly devote time to each of them in any meaningful way, so instead I'd like to talk about the repeated themes and techniques that Tremblay uses throughout. So the title story, Growing Things, Swim wants to know if it's as bad as Swim thinks, where we all will be, and it's against the law to feed the ducks, are all about global collapse. Teotwaki incidents. Interestingly, only Swim wants to know if it's as bad as Swim thinks is from the perspective of a parent, and only that one, along with where we all will be, are from the perspective of children. I don't typically like child points of view, because I don't like the way children's minds work, and I usually feel like it gives the writer a pass on more complex language and nuance, but Tremblay used it as a way of not overemphasizing the horrors of the end of the world and mostly kept a third person close limited to allow for more interesting language. The main characters of Swim Wants to Know If It's As Bad As Swim Thinks and Where We All Will Be are both not exactly what people would consider well-functioning adults, so all of them have a naivete in the face of the end of the world. These reminded me of Kevin Brockmeyer's The Illumination and Invasion of the Body Snatchers, the Donald Sutherland movie. Where We All Will Be really reminded me of the movie Us. But before I get too much into reference, let me just say that I love narratives about the end of the world, especially if it is weird. Now, though, with the current events, I'm not so sure I'm in the right state of mind for that kind of story. I started the book long before the virus was in the U.S., so it wasn't until I recently finished the anthology that I got uncomfortable, and things do feel surreal and weird right now. So that was hard to stomach. When it came to weird ways of telling stories, Tremblay used a few epistolary techniques and strange narrative methods. 19 Snapshots of Dennis Port is told through the speaking of the narrative to a person they are showing photos of their vacation. Notes for the barn in the wild and notes from the dog walkers are journals or notes. Something about birds is partly interview format. The teacher is a plural point of view of a bunch of students. The ice tower does this as well, with the climbers being the plural point of view. But it also has a split narrative where it has a secondary singular point of view. A haunted house is a wheel upon which some are broken is a short and more direct use of the choose-your-own-adventure method that I first read in R.L. Stein Goosebumps novels. This actually works better in an ebook format because I remember putting multiple fingers on multiple pages throughout the book when I read Goosebumps. Fun aside, one of these I read as a kid had a choice early on, go to the party or stay home. I chose stay home because I'm an introvert. And when I went to the directed page, it said, this is a novel, staying home would be boring, you go to the party. This actually made me laugh out loud, and of course, it's memorable, but Tremblay's is more Proust-like in that it is essentially a drifting through of rooms and the memories those rooms hold. I'm not sure what the narrative gains by doing this, and I just read them in order, which was possible from the prompts. The Society of the Monsterhood starts with a plural point of view, but it narrows to a singular one towards the end, much like the teacher. Further questions for the somn sam somnambulist. Further questions for the somnambulist is uh strange. I'm not sure there is a descriptive term that can accurately capture what's going on with this story. By this point in my reading, I'd gotten the audiobook to help me finish because I was having trouble focusing. My ebook had a different order of the questions than the audiobook, so that was a little difficult. The story doesn't work in ebook format, much like House of Stairs, but I didn't enjoy it in the same way as I enjoyed House of Stairs, and I actually didn't feel any impact from the story at all. My only memory is that it's three voices asking questions. 
The content of the questions didn't really stick with me. The 13th temple is in second person, but also broken up into 13 sections about the temples with third person from the perspective of a child again, except one of them is first person. Tremblay shows his mastery of storytelling with these techniques, which allow for more interesting perspectives and increases the engagement by changing things up for what might otherwise blend together. I like the sense of play in these stories. I like seeing Tremblay's attention to how a story is told as adding to the impact of the story itself. For the most part, obviously, since further notes for the som som somnambulist didn't work for me. I noticed that many of the stories involve tall things and the horror they held. Growing things, Swim wants to know if it's as bad as Swim thinks, the Ice Tower, the Society of the Monsterhood, and the Thirteenth Temple are all related to things towering over the narrators. I almost feel like this connects to the frequent use of the child's perspective. Adults are typically taller than children, and children are often somewhat terrorized by adults in their size, even if the adult isn't dangerous. There is some fear of being overpowered by someone who is larger, a sense of powerlessness. This is a theme throughout the stories, with other versions of powerlessness where towering is not present, such as the inevitability felt in the getaway, and this is a central tenet of horror stories. Tremblay manages to do this without overdoing it. I caught on to it, but I wasn't tired of it by the end because he kept varying how the towering and powerlessness was presented. The powerlessness theme also reminds me of Rod Serling's style of horror, but instead of a Twilight Zone final twist moment, which R.L. Stein utilized and H.P. Lovecraft is the original master of, Tremblay instead slowly feeds the reader the answer to the cause of the horror. I like the slow build through subtext more than I do the last sentence twist, which often feels like a gimmick to me and gets old fast. Another theme that is often brought up and comes about from the child perspective or ruminations on childhood is a mother who is dead and the failure of the father to be a good parent after her passing, whether it was from illness, foul play, or a horror element. This theme felt more clunky to me, and I was tired of it during a house is a wheel upon which some are broken. At that point, it was obvious and a little grating. This theme is in Growing Things and Her Red Right Hand. Grief is destructive, and often does destroy a parent's ability to be a good parent. But I feel like this is a thing with Tremblay, something he may focus on too much because of personal reasons. The failure of fathers is also thematic in 19 Snapshots of Dennisport, where we all will be, and... Well, the story doesn't have a title. It's just a blank space. That's probably the story about fatherhood I dislike the most. While it is well written and interesting, its examination of the other woman and the philandering father is one I don't really need told to me again. It's a cliché, and making it a horror story doesn't make it any more interesting. I'm somewhat tired of the genderized narratives about how men fail those around them. I still want flawed male characters, but the cliché that men are bad parents and generally not great people is one I'm tired of. I just don't really think this is necessary anymore. It's a broken record at this point. I know I sound like a broken record in response to it, but that's because it is so prevalent in current narratives, social media, and internet journalism. I especially don't think it's an accurate depiction of men as human beings. They are flawed. We all are. But that doesn't make their flaws unforgivable, nor does it mean their flaws are all so uniform. I've often written from the male perspective, mostly because I don't often connect to the common Western woman, and I've never set out to make those men detestable, even when I make their actions such. I understand that it sucks when a man fails you in ways directly linked to gender issues, and even more if that man is the parent when he fails. But hey, it sucks just as bad when a woman does this, and the argument that men do it more than women is based only on allegorical evidence and data that is clouded by confirmation bias. When a woman fails her children, it's not any less damaging. We have this weird idea that when men fail their children, it means they fail to teach their sons to be good men and made their daughters look for validation through objectification. And when women fail their children, it means they made their sons wimps and their daughters depressed and neurotic. 
a lot of this social consensus is based on very old psychological theory formed when very traditional values and clear gender delineations were the standard. So those narratives and social judgments are based on archaic and disproven understandings of men and women. I'll be honest, I always question the idea that men and women were biologically different in the brain. It's so hard to prove such a thing when there's no such thing as a brain not influenced by social constructs. How men and women fail, and fail as parents, are not divided by gender. Some mothers are abusive or absentee, and some fathers create self-consciousness and sexual repression. And I appreciate stories that acknowledge that parents fuck up in ways that are not divided by gender. Like, Swim wants to know if it's as bad as Swim thinks. When Tremblay wasn't focused on the theme of how men fail, the stories were always better and more interesting. They presented more realistic characters, and that's why I think his recurrent depiction of failing fathers was personal. A few of the stories were focused on storytelling and storytellers. Growing Things, Something About Birds, It Won't Go Away, Notes from Dog Walkers, Her Red Right Hand, and The Thirteenth Temple all dealt with people discussing or having their stories discussed by someone else. Growing Things and The Thirteenth Temple are both somewhat told from the perspective of Mary and are partly about the loss of her elder sister Marjorie, either to an emotional and mental wasting away or a much more direct loss, and how as a child she can't quite grasp what is happening to her sister. In Growing Things, however, Mary is a child throughout and Marjorie is the one telling stories. In The Thirteenth Temple, Mary is the one telling the story and understands more about what happened now that she's an adult. These are alternative universes for the stories, not that the 13th Temple is a looking back on the events of growing things. Something About Birds is a great look into the elite illiterati's love of complicated and obscure narrative, something that I find stupid. If it's strange and hard to understand, they love it, even if it actually means nothing and is poorly done. And the story even pokes at the idea that the elite illiterati act like they understood narratives when they are just pretending to because it makes them feel superior, even if no one gives a crap if they have some higher understanding. It Won't Go Away is really fun because it is the classic proliferating, inescapable horror, but about writers. Notes from the Dog Walkers might be my favorite story because it makes no sense that someone would receive these notes and keep letting these people walk their dog. Also, it connects directly to It Won't Go Away and is a little self-deprecating, which was pretty awesome. At one point, I started to think that there might be only one dog walker who had dissociative identity disorder because the two women's voices were sometimes too close and all three of them didn't have boundaries. But I liked having that thought. I didn't consider it a mistake. Tremblay pays attention to details too closely throughout for me to believe he didn't want me to think that. Her Red Right Hand, another child perspective, was mostly about how narrative could be used to work through things like grief, but it wasn't my favorite. Now, I've not brought up the teacher or our town's monster. I know that Tremblay is a teacher, so it's obvious why something like the teacher may be on his mind. It starts with the students loving him, and by the end, I hated him for ruining their lives. I felt like it is a metaphor for how knowledge destroys innocence. Too much, too early, and it all goes to shit for that person. The dinner scenes brought an interesting question to mind, though. Was the family always sullen and disconnected, but it was only the narrator's lack of innocence that made her aware of it? It's just a thought. Our Town's Monster seems pretty obviously about the rewriting and covering up of history that is not idyllic. Human beings grow old, they die and history will only reflect those things that the people in power will want others to see, whatever is in their best interest, even at the expense of future lives. Very unsavory. I absolutely do recommend growing things. It's horror, it's complex, it's interesting. I may not like everything he does, but Tremblay put out a great collection of short stories, despite what KB may say. But what did you think of growing things? What was your favorite story? Your favorite recurrence? What was your least favorite story or theme? Anything you wish I had discussed in more detail? Any pro tips for not going insane while I'm trapped in my house like Mary and growing things? Let me know in the comments below and please mark all spoilers.
Would you like to see what I'm currently reading? Follow me on goodreads.com slash outsfalltrades to see what I'm reading right now and what book reviews you can expect in the future. I've made a Discord! I'm on it all the time and you're all invited to chat with me. There are channels for video games, movies, TV shows, books, and writing. Even a place for you to promote your own things. Join me there! Everyone is welcome. This has been the Sunday Book Circle, and if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, share, subscribe, click that bell, leave a comment below, visit my blog at empatheticwriter.wordpress.com, and follow me on Patreon for exclusive content and a shout out on a video. Merch, 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 merch merch yeah check out my new shop at cafepress.com slash alexvaltrades for all kinds of products with my face on them